If you are in or have been through the school system, then you must understand just how much the last day of school means to the average student. The final classes, mini parties, and even pranks just make the end of the year all the more special. That's it. It is not difficult to understand Nathaniel's frustration when he was sent home from school because he was caught throwing water balloons. Of course, he wasn't the only one involved in the act, but other students were quicker and managed to get away before they can get into any trouble. What's worse, Nathaniel did not get to bid his girlfriend a proper goodbye before he went home for the summer. Unfortunately, the anger Nathaniel harbored toward the member of staff who had sent him home eventually manifest against Nathaniel's favorite teacher in the most unreasonable and unspeakable way. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we'll be taking a look at the case of Nathaniel Brazil and just how this teenage honors middle school student landed himself in jail for committing a tragic crime that no one saw coming. Nathaniel Brazil was born on the 22nd of September, 1986 to parents Polly Powell and Nathaniel Brazil Sr. From the tender age of five, Nathaniel had witnessed his mother being domestically abused by her former husbands and boyfriends. It is not certain when his parents separated, but by the time of the murder, Nathaniel was living with his mother, a two-year-old sister, and his mother's then husband. Nathaniel's father, on the other hand, was said to be living in Daytona Beach and having very limited interactions with his son. According to reports, Nathaniel Brazil Sr. sent Polly $50 every week, presumably for his son's upkeep. Despite the less than ideal circumstances surrounding Nathaniel's upbringings, he was an honor student with an excellent attendance and no history of violence or discipline problems. Nathaniel attended Lake Worth Middle School in Lake Worth, Florida. For the most part, teachers described him as being soft-spoken, bright, and well-liked. Of these teachers who spoke highly of him, Nathaniel's favorite was his language arts teacher, Barry Gruno. While he was an all-around A student, the seventh grade seemed to have been quite a challenge for Nathaniel. Whether or not this was due to his situation at home is unclear, but Nathaniel's academic record showed that his grades had significantly dropped over the school year. To further highlight this, investigations revealed on the 15th of April 2000, just about a month before the tragic event, Nathaniel had written a letter to Barry. In the letter, the teenager explained how his seventh grade year had been a significantly difficult period for him. He complained about being picked on by his classmates and teachers, and even contemplated committing suicide. Barry had been known to stand up for Nathaniel and encouraged him when others made fun of him for his passion for studying and academic excellence. This must have contributed a great deal to the 13-year-old finding a safe space and confidence in his teacher. Of course, being at the start of his teenage life, there was something else in the mix of Nathaniel's schoolwork and home life. Yes, hormones. Testimonies from some of Nathaniel's friends revealed that he had developed feelings for one of his classmates, Denora Rosales. Denora had been Nathaniel's first girlfriend, giving him his first kiss, which would eventually turn out to be their last, just six days before things went horribly wrong. Born on the 6th of July, 1964, Barry Gruno was a Detroit native whose father died when he was young. He grew up in a working class household in the Cabana Colony neighborhood near Palm Beach Gardens. With his height of six foot three inches and his decent athletic abilities, Barry earned all conference basketball honors at Jupiter High where he studied. In what could be said to be an unfortunate hindsight, Barry had granted an interview to the Post as a freshman at Florida Atlantic University. The interview was for a 1986 Labor Day story about people's worst jobs. In the interview, the then 25-year-old spoke about why he quit his summer job as a convenience store clerk just two weeks into the role. You're there for eight hours, he said in the interview. Any minute, a killer could come in and gun me between the eyes. Little did he know that sooner, rather than later, he would meet a similar fate. By the time of the interview, 
Barry had begun dating Pamela Halauka, a former special education teacher. Barry finished university in 1987 and was employed as an English teacher at Loggers Run Middle School, west of Boca Raton. Barry and Pamela eventually got married in 1991 when he was 27 years old. The couple had two children and lived on North O Street in Lake Worth. According to several reports, Barry Gruno was not only a dedicated teacher who took his job seriously, but he was also a loving father. He was deeply loved by his wife and children. On the 26th of May 2000, Nathaniel Brazil left home for the last day of school with a small bouquet of orange and white flowers and a silver balloon in his hands. Yes, you guessed right. These items were for his girlfriend, Denora. Nathaniel planned to give them to her just before his first lesson. As it turns out, the gifts for Denora were not the only unconventional items Nathaniel took to school on that fateful day. Hidden in the youngster's backpack were water balloons. It was the last day of school, and Nathaniel was determined to make the most of it. After attending his language arts class with Mr. Gruno and having his lunch, Nathaniel went to band practice, where he played the tuba. After his next lesson, Nathaniel made a stop at the bathroom to fill up the water balloons he had brought to school. Soon, he was part of a group of about 12 students who were involved in a water fight. While it was the last day of school, the teachers were not willing to condone any bad behavior, and so they immediately set out to catch the students involved. As expected, everyone involved in the water fight dispersed at the sight of a counselor. Everyone but Nathaniel and a 13-year-old girl, that is. Being the only ones found on the scene, the two were sent home as punishment. In line with the punishment that had been given to them, both students left the school, but Nathaniel was not happy about the development. The 13-year-old girl who was sent home alongside Nathaniel later revealed that Nathaniel had promised to return to the school and harm the counselor who had sent them home. According to the girl, Nathaniel had said something along the lines of, just watch, I'll be all over the news. And what is more horrifying is that the teenager kept to his word. The previous weekend, Nathaniel had visited Boynton Beach, where a man who he regarded as his grandfather lived. While at the beach home, Nathaniel snatched a 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic handgun and some loose bullets that were stored in a drawer. What interest would a 13-year-old have in such an item, you may ask? Well, Nathaniel had been fascinated by the possibility of a career in law enforcement, so he was very interested in guns. He had taken the old man's gun to inspect it and figure out how it worked. Unfortunately, his plan went a little too well. After being sent home from school, Nathaniel retrieved the gun and hid it in his pocket. He then returned to school on his bicycle. His sole mission? To tell his girlfriend a proper goodbye before the start of the summer holidays. Or at least that is what it seemed like at first glance. Once at school, Nathaniel went in search of Denora and her friend. It so happened that they were both in a lesson with Mr. Gruno at that time of the day, 3.25 p.m. Undeterred by this, Nathaniel walked into Gruno's class and asked to see the two girls. Security cameras capture Mr. Gruno speaking with Nathaniel outside of the classroom. Gruno, unaware that Nathaniel had been sent home, most likely asked him for a hall pass and told him that he could not see the girls. Surprisingly, this was not what provoked Nathaniel. According to Nathaniel, Mr. Gruno was laughing, which made him mad. Supposedly, Gruno's laughter enraged Nathaniel to the point that he pulled out a gun. A few seconds later, students in Mr. Gruno's class heard him say, Stop pointing that gun at me, Nate. Everyone was alarmed, even Nathaniel himself. According to him, he had been shaking uncontrollably in the standoff with his teacher. Then, as 14-year-old Mark Ariat later put it, there was a big pop, and Gruno dropped dead in front of a row of lockers. In the blink of an eye, students came running out of the class shouting, He shot Mr. Gruno! He really had! Having taken a bullet to his head, Gruno now lay dead in a pool of his own blood.
dazed by what had happened in the last few minutes, Nathaniel did the only thing he could hear his body telling him to do. Run. And run he did. As Nathaniel raced down the hallway, John James, a mathematics teacher who had also taught Nathaniel, stepped out of his classroom to see the commotion that was going on. Not wanting anything or anyone to get in his way, Nathaniel waved the gun at James, warning him that he was not afraid to use it by saying the words, Don't bother me, Mr. James. Realizing that the threat was real, the math teacher quickly backed up into his classroom with his hands raised, and Nathaniel made his escape. Once outside the building, Nathaniel discovered that his bike had been moved from where he had left it. He ran across the school compound, jumped over the fence, and was racing down the street when a police car came around. Nathaniel flagged down the car and recognized the driver as Officer Mike Mahoney, whom he knew from his neighborhood. Dropping to his knees beside the officer, Nathaniel confessed, I shot somebody. A few hours later, Nathaniel asked detectives how Bruno was faring. When told that his teacher had died, Nathaniel broke down sobbing. When Nathaniel had not returned home from school by 3.30 p.m. that afternoon, Polly grew worried. What could have happened to her son? She would find out 30 minutes later when her sister called to deliver the news. Nathaniel had been arrested. A while later, when Polly arrived at the interrogation room where her son was being held, the teenager began to weep and shake. Polly wiped the tears from her son's face. If I taught you anything, didn't I teach you to think first? She asked him in tears. Barry Gruno's death was tragic, not only for the school and students who greatly admired him, but for a number of other people. His death signaled the creation of a void in at least three people's lives. His wife and two children, who were aged four and nine years old at the time of his death. According to Ben Marlin, the then Palm Beach County School Superintendent, Pamela Gruno kept asking the question why repeatedly when he had gone down to the Gruno home on a condolence visit. This loss was tragic in that it not only affected Gruno's immediate family, but rippled the rest of the community. Since Gruno was liked and admired by all, it's little wonder that many people were devastated by the news of his death. When asked about his teacher, Nathaniel said, I like the way he interacted with us and other students, the way he played basketball and he hung out with us. As far as we were in class, he just sat back and talked to us. Gruno's likability made it less surprising when about 1,600 people showed up for his memorial service. While grieving her deceased husband, Pamela Gruno was committed to doing a lot more than hosting a memorial service in memory of him. She sued the pawn shop that had sold the gun to Nathaniel's grandfather and the Palm Beach County School Board. These cases were settled out of court for over $1 million, but Pam did not stop there. She went ahead to sue the company that made the gun and won a ruling of $1.2 million. However, an appeals court rejected the ruling, concluding that the gun was anything but defective. With the money she received from court settlements, Pamela started a foundation that gave scholarships and support to students, continuing the life work and dream of her husband. On the other side of the coin, Nathaniel's world seemed to be crashing down. Just months after he was arrested, Nathaniel's mother, Polly, found out that she had breast cancer. Regardless, Polly refused to give up on her son. So in 2003, she mustered all the strength she could and went in the company of other parents of teenagers who had committed murder, to see the Vatican to try to change the U.S. practice of trying teenagers as adults. In 2008, a now 43-year-old Polly died of breast cancer. With his father cutting off all communications with him, Nathaniel was left without any immediate family. I know you're probably wondering about what I just said. Yes, Nathaniel was tried as an adult. After his arrest, the then Palm Beach County State Attorney decided to try Nathaniel as an adult on the charges of first degree murder. This was not uncommon at the time as there were about 15 teenagers who had been convicted of first degree murder. Florida and other states adopted this method of trying teenagers as adults to obtain the highest possible punishment and manage the spike in juvenile crime rates. Robert Udell, Nathaniel's defense attorney, was not swayed 
and stayed true to his belief that Nathaniel should not get sentenced to life in prison or the death sentence. According to Robert, Nathaniel was one of the finest men I ever met in my 30 years of practice. Robert stuck to the argument that Nathaniel had only brought the gun to school to intimidate people and ended up killing Bruno by accident. Nathaniel himself agreed, as he mentioned in a future interview that his first mistake was stealing the gun from his grandfather in the first place. On the 16th of May 2001, after hours of deliberation, the jury found Nathaniel guilty of second degree murder and aggravated assault for waving the gun at Mr. James. He was sentenced to 28 years in a state prison, followed by seven years probation. Considering the living circumstances in prison, Nathaniel may have been negatively influenced. Prison records show about 15 instances of disciplinary action, although mostly for minor offenses like lying or disrespecting an official and violating of telephone and mail privileges. He was cited for three major violence-related offenses over the span of 14 years, but only admitted to the first, which was for fighting back in 2001, claiming that the others were fabricated. In search of proper treatment while in prison, Nathaniel filed seven lawsuits and submitted 500 administrative complaints against the prison system. One of the lawsuits has been settled. This does not come as a surprise, as while still in prison, Nathaniel maintained his reputation as an exemplary student. He has continued to study hard. He earned his general education diploma and passed other examinations, certifying him as a law clerk and as a paralegal. This most likely informed his knowledge about the law and his rights, in addition to the support received from his legal team. Nathaniel has regretted not being able to attend the funeral services of both Mr. Gruno and his mother, as he was in prison and was not granted leave. He says he has already petitioned the state senator to allow him to attend the funeral ceremony of his maternal grandmother when she dies. However, it is likely that Nathaniel's petition will never be granted, as he told his grandmother that she needs to, in his words, live to be 115 so she can see me become the first lawyer in our family. On his way to a career in law enforcement, Nathaniel is being held at the Jackson Correctional Institution. His release date is set for the 18th of May 2028 when he will be 41 years old. The unfortunate events leading to the death of Barry Gruno have caused many people to share their different opinions on Nathaniel's sentence. While some people think that it is a good thing that after the completion of his 28 years, Nathaniel will be given another shot at life, others believe that he should have been subject to the full extent of the law, seeing how his actions caused so much trauma to those who witnessed the event. And of course, Gruno having lost his life and his children growing up without their father. What do you think? Do you believe Nathaniel should have gotten the life sentence? Or are you of the opinion that he deserves another shot at life? Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Nathaniel Brazil. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.